Father, I want to talk to you again. Lord, I want to thank you in Jesus' name for your word. Help me, Father, tonight to speak words, Father, anointed by the power of your spirit. Lord, I believe that you brought me to this message for a purpose. Help me, Father, to give it out of a heart of love, empowered by your Spirit. Anoint the words you have given me, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Shining Brightly is the title of our message tonight. How many of you know that while Jesus ministered here on earth in the midst of real society facing real challenges, he told his followers that they were like sheep among wolves. That's Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Sheep among wolves. History bears testimony to the ebb and flow relationship between man and God, which impacts not just the human heart, but also entire communities, churches, Cities, countries, and even continents. For instance, I used to love to study the history of revival uh, at Southeastern Bible College. For instance, there was a time when Europe was an utterly pagan place. But then a wave of missionaries and evangelists brought with them the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of grace and acceptance and love and Christianity swept beautifully across the land. You know when that was? In the early 1900s. Revival broke out in England and Europe and then moved over to America. Did you know that? A lot of the birth of many of the Pentecostal churches was in the beginning of that century. Over time, however, the people fell away from the faith that had saved them. The culture digressed. And an entire continent fell headlong into secularism, society without any use for God. So like I say, ebb then flow, then ebb. Where do you think we are in America today? Somewhat of an ebb, right? Does that mean we are without hope? No. This same trend can be seen when we look at our country. What was once a nation founded on Judeo-Christian principles has now become a secular society of people who have little use for God as a whole. While Jesus ministered here on earth, I'm going to repeat what I said earlier. While Jesus ministered here on earth, in the midst of real society facing real challenges, he told his followers that they were like sheep among wolves in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. To survive, he continued, and I'm paraphrasing, we would have to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. We would need to keep in mind that while we are to refrain from, uh, from every turn from harming others, we live in a world that doesn't necessarily share that lack of ill intent. We have to be suspicious while somehow remaining sweet because we're living among wolves. And wolves seek to devour. This scripture describes the situation clearly. I want you to grab your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 1. We're going to read verses 18 through 20. Now, I'm going to take a moment here. I'm going to take a moment while you're finding Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. I'm going to preface something I'm going to say tonight. A few weeks back, I made some uh, remarks in a service. And looking back in retrospect over being asked of several questions, I looked back in retrospect and what, what it appeared like I had done and because I did it. I just took a few verses out of Romans chapter 1, which means, what did I do? I took them out of context and said some pretty disparaging things. And I've got to give context to correct that tonight. Amen? In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, it says, listen to this now, because you're going to remember the passage of Scripture I read. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they're without excuse. Now, I'm going to continue. You'll hear the part I took out of context. Not on purpose, not by design. It just happened, all right? 
But whenever you realize that something like that has happened, if you're a leader, you go back and you fix it. Am I right or wrong? That's right. You fix it. So a few verses down, we read this stunning and sobering implications of secularized society. But what I did was I read one part. I didn't read the whole thing. We're going to have to spend a little time in Romans chapter 1 to get this straightened out. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and that's the problem. The problem, the main problem being addressed is people, people, who do not like to retain God in their knowledge. Does that make sense? I'm not twisting that. I'm not taking that out of context. That's accurate, right? God gave them over to debased mind to do things which are not fitting. That's verse 22 through 28. And to what habits does God give them over to? Verses 29 through 32 spell it out in graphic detail. Listen to me now. So what I did was I made it sound like that that, um, that there was a segment of society that is the problem with the world, the whole part of the world. Do you understand what I'm saying? I just talked about the sin of homosexuality. That's all I did. I didn't, I didn't say anything else. And that that is the result of people not retaining God in their knowledge. That's only, that's only part of what the Word was saying on the subject. And I've got to finish it, keep it in context. Why? How many of you would agree that there's a lot of things about that lifestyle that God doesn't agree with? Do you have a problem with understanding that? There's a lot about that lifestyle that God doesn't agree with. So if we stand in the pulpit and we speak out against it according to the Word, then we've taken a stand on the Word. That for that I cannot and will not apologize. But when I made all of the focus about that one segment of society, it was out of balance. It was not correct. What it's referring to, that all of the sin of the world is a resort of that attitude, not just one people group. All of mankind that has not retained the knowledge of God in their heart and minds committed to this problem. And the end result of the gay community is not, not the only thing that's the result of that. Why? How do I know? Why? And it raised questions in the hearts of minds of some of you, and I don't blame you. I'm not afraid you do you to ask me about it, all right? So, we're addressing it, all right? So, furthermore, we learn that these people, the ones whom God is giving over, are quite uh, deserving of the punishment they will face. But it isn't, it is, I'm not just, I'm not focused on the gay community. How many of you know, how many of you have been with me long enough to know that I love people? I love people. I don't agree with everyone's lifestyle, and guess what? Everyone doesn't agree with mine. Are you with me? Are you following? Now watch. So to what habits does God give them over to? This is what i got to get straight. In verses 29 through 32, it's spelled out graphically. Sexual immorality, yes. But is, is, is sexual immorality just one group of people? No, sexual immorality takes many forms. Amen? Wickedness, does that say wicked gay people? No. Does it say... Um, covetousness, anybody can covet, amen? Maliciousness, envy, murder, strife, deceit, and evil-mindedness. What I'm trying to tell you is that these are the things that God, it's like Pastor Isaac said to one of, a response to one of the devotionals given. God loves us. He doesn't want us to go to hell. Do you agree with that? But he will allow you to be buried in your sin. He will allow it. Do you know it's because God has more respect for us and our decision-making process than we have for his? I'm talking about mankind now. I'm not talking about one people group. I'm not talking about, you understand what I'm saying? And you know what? You know why I love people, period? Because God loves people, period. And he's proven already that he'd do anything for us except deny his own word. 
He'll not deny his own word. So it says in verse 29 through 32, it spells it out in graphic detail, turns them over to sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, e envy, murder, strife, deceit, and e evil-mindedness. According to the same passage of Scripture, there's whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. And that's not one people group in the world. That is a people group that is outside of the covering of God. That's mankind at his worst. So I'm not picking on any one people group. I love people. And please forgive me for taking that passage of Scripture out of context just a few weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon. Please forgive me for that. And I know that if I'm honest about it and I ask for forgiveness, I'll get forgiveness. Amen? All right. So, the description reads like a news website or a newspaper on any given day. Indeed, you and I are living among the unbelieving generation. That's what I'll call it. It's the unbelieving generation. I like that. People who are undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. That's the world. Amen? The result of this unlovely living is a society that is first and foremost suffers from one, a twisted morality. And I don't care what sin, pick one. Pick one. A twisted morality. What once embarrassed and shamed us now does not faze us. And listen, it, it's been going on a long time. Our young people today are growing up in a world that has taught them that things when I was growing up at their age, you wouldn't even think about going public on. Do you understand what I'm saying? And they don't think anything about it because the rules. Well, um, times have changed. But child of God, God hasn't. Times, what have I told you so many times? God's not restricted by time. You can't fit God in a time box. Amen? He doesn't change. He doesn't fluctuate. Just because some law's been passed that says it's okay. That, ha that causes our young people to believe, well, that must be okay. When this book is not, no longer the roadmap for the life of our young people, they're going to believe what the world tells them. It, it's sad. It's scary. It's frightening. Number one, a twist of morality. What once embarrassed and shamed us now doesn't faze us. What used to slink down dark back alleyways now struts along the main streets of people's hearts. This type of living also produces a society that is twisted spiritually. If we indulge our wickedness long enough and we eventually become, then we eventually become anti-God. We get angry about God. We get angry with people that are willing to stand in a pulpit and say what the book says. We get angry with them. We get mad. But I can tell you right now, this is a pastor that I don't have any intention of hurting you. I remember telling one of the pastors at Change Point Northeast, we used to have to go over there and get all of our sermon notes approved. There's nothing wrong with that. I learned more about preaching from Dan Gerald in the hours that I spent with him, I did my entire life leading up till then, all right? That's why I'm not going to keep you too long tonight until you're so wore out you can't receive a word I say. Amen? We eventually become anti-God. What I, what I was saying was I told Dan Gerald, look, Dan Gerald's looking at me and he's saying, do we really want to approve this guy? I don't know. Do we really want to approve him to get in the pulpit of the church? Greg was still here. You understand what I'm saying? And I was still young enough then, this is just a few years ago, and I'm 66, but I was still young enough to look at Dan Gerald, and I said, Dan, I promise you, I won't do or say anything to hurt the church. He said, stop right there. I hate to break it to you, but you will. You will say things that hurt the church and, and, and upset people. It's inevitable. You're, you're going to miss it once in a while. You're going to say something you shouldn't say. You're going to upset people. What, he said, then what are you going to do? I said, well, if I'm wrong, I'm going to fix it. That's what leaders do. If you make a mistake and you, and you break something, you do your best you can to fix it and you move forward. Amen? You fix it and you move forward. 
We step away from the truths of salvation, figuring we're better off going it alone. We're not. Amen? We buy, or we eye the Bible with foolhardy skepticism, finding it a book of fables and nothing more. And that's what people do today out there in the world. You know, they'd much rather, what, what it, it boggles my mind that anyone, and I've read the Koran. Did you know that? I've read in it. I've read the book. You see what I'm saying? I've compared, you know, I've read the Book of Mormon. I've, but I'm telling you, this is the book that I've never found anything in it. It, it, that, in other words, this book is the flawless one. It's without fault. It's, but, well, brother, I've had people say, but what about this? I had a person tell me one time, is it true in the Old Testament that God told the children of Israel to go in and kill everybody, the men, the women, and the children, and all their livestock and everything? I said, yep, he did it in the form of judgment. He said, and here's what he said, I could never serve a God like that. I said, well... You're making a life and death decision based off of one thing in the Bible and you have no idea why God wanted them destroyed. With a long-suffering and patient God like I serve, do you know how bad it had to be and for how long it had to be that bad for God to say, wipe them out? Because, and what was the reason? Judgment and they will contaminate my people. They'll Lead my people away. They'll lead them astray to worship their gods. Wipe them out. And every time Israel disobeyed God and didn't wipe them out, they did just exactly what God said they would do. The problems caused. We, we while away our days and lives chasing counterfeit answers to God. But in the end, science and business and vain pleasures can do nothing to scratch what I call, I call it the angry itch. The angry itch in our souls. Certainly it's important for us as Christ followers to keep our distance from such characteristics being twisted. But God expects still more. He says we must also speak out against these habits. Am I right or wrong? He says we must also speak out against these habits. We must actively disapprove of these trends. I'm not looking to hurt anybody. But people, do you have to guess where I stand? I love you too much to make you guess where I stand. You could even be saying here today, well, Brother Dennis, I, I know some of these people that you're referring to, and I, I think they're wonderful people. You know what? There's, there's nice people out there. There's nice people out there that aren't serving God. Did you know that? But their destiny is still the same. In Romans 1.32, says it this way. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Those of us who believe in Jesus and have staked our very lives on his saving grace are called to stand against all forms of ungodliness. We're called to help our society once again pursue God. But how do we get it done? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, it says, you're here to be salt seasoning. Um, this is a paraphrase. You're the salt of the earth, amen? You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. That, that, that's about as plain Jane English as you can get on the subject. Amen? I wrote, one day Jesus looked into the eyes of his disciples who were seated before him on the side of a mountain and reassured them that it is possible to live as citizens of his kingdom in a fallen and fractured world. Jesus may well have said with this verse of Scripture, listen, I know you'll meet a lot of tasteless people, hear a lot of tasteless jokes, and see a lot of tasteless things down here on planet Earth, but don't lose heart. As you fulfill your mission to honor God with your life, you will bring tastefulness back in style. Say, well, Brother Dennis, the way things look out there now, I just can't see that happening. Let God show you. Like he showed the servant of that prophet in the Old Testament when the prophet said, Father, open his eyes and let him see that those that are with us are greater than those that are with them or those that are against us. 
Greater are those that are with us than those that are against us. That's right, Gloria. Thank you for the encouragement. As we fulfill our mission to honor God with our lives, He will bring tastefulness back in style. Keep in mind as you walk through life that you have far more influence than you know. Did you hear that? Keep in mind as you walk through life that you have far more influence than you know. Just like the apostles. We can be average Joes and Janes going about our average daily lives. And yet God lays his hand upon us and declares us fit to utterly change the world. Amen. The most powerful agent of change in this world is not the government. It's not the military. It's not entertainers or leaders of industry. No. The most powerful agent of change in Christ's church are people committed to doing His will. Amen? So the first part there was be savory as salt. The second point, salt preserves and protects. So what does being salt have to do with it? Well, when Jesus told His disciples and us that we are the salt of the earth, He reinforced our role as those who preserve and protect the crown of his creation. We'll try to, I'm trying to get some light to that. The salt of Jesus' time was full of minerals and had an unmatched ability to preserve and protect valuable food in the days before refrigeration and the practice of packing with ice were available. If fishermen, if they reeled in, or reeled in a net or brought in a net with a large amount of fish, for example, and needed to transport it from Capernaum to Jerusalem, a distance of about 120 miles, if I'm not mistaken, this person would be sure to salt it down so that it didn't spoil en route. He'd rub the salt into the flesh of the fish, penetrating it, preserving it, and protecting it. Well, that sounds like that salt got involved. Amen? We're to penetrate our culture with grace and truth so that those living in this life besides us are not spoiled by sin en route. We can help people, but we're getting to where we're afraid to open our mouth, and we've got to stop that. We've got to stop that. Another aspect of Jesus' metaphor is, next, salt seasons. Listen to this now. Salt season, and it stinks. How many have ever got, accidentally got salt in a wound? Or put salt in a, in a wound on purpose? It stings, right? You'd likely had the experience of being in a movie theater with a belly full of salty buttered popcorn. Been there, done that. The only thing you can think about is washing it down with an oversized Coke, which is why movie theaters can get away with charging $5 for a soda that costs them mere pennies to make. But the point is this, salt makes us thirsty. When Jesus told us to be salty, he was in essence saying, let your life make others thirsty for God. We are to craft our lives in such a way that our thoughts, our habits, our actions and reactions make people who know us simply crave God. Perhaps you've known the agony of swimming in the ocean with a fresh cut on your face or your leg or somewhere on your body. You can feel that, can't you? Maybe you sliced your skin shaving that morning and completely forgot about the gash until you dove into that body of salt water and were quickly reminded as you winced in pain. Salt can sting. It's true in the physical realm, and it's true in the spiritual realm. If you follow Jesus long enough, you're going to encounter people who don't appreciate hearing truth. Duh. <laughs> Amen. It's stinging rebukes to their godless life, and inside they wince in pain. But still, we must, we've got to proclaim the message Jesus has asked us to proclaim. We're called to be salt, not sugar. You yeah, notice that? We're called to be salt, not sugar in the world. We're called to season and to sting. Let me give you one more duo about living the salty life. Salt cleanses and heals. If you've ever had a sore throat, then you know that one of the quickest, most surefire ways to soothe the passage and relieve the pain is gargling salt water. My grandmother made me do it when I was little, and it worked for me. 
I don't know medically whether it's sound advice or not. All I know is it worked for me. Amen? Similar, similarly, we are to look for parts of our homes, our communities, our cities, our world in need of soothing, in need of relief. We are to be salt that cleanses and that heals. By our saltiness, we can help mend what is broken. We can lift up what has been laid down. We can bring to life what has been massacred. We can be a blessing each day of our lives. This is what Jesus meant that day when he called his followers to live as salt. So in conclusion, and I really mean it, in conclusion, last night my family, we were all together and they were mocking me again <laughs> about me using the phrase in conclusion. I remember a, a little kid sitting in church leaned over and asked the preacher's kid, why does your father always take off his watch when he gets to the pulpit and lay it on the pulpit in front of him? And the preacher's kid said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Which I think is kind of funny. In conclusion, number one, do you remember the title of the message? Anybody remember? Shining brightly. One, shine brightly as lights. On that same day, on that same hillside, during that same conversation with his wide-eyed disciples, Jesus offered another metaphor for living, building on the salt speech he just delivered. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, he said, Not are only are you to be salt, the salt of the earth, but also you are to be light. Let me read you verbatim what it says. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. You know, when ancient civilizations were formed, cities often were built along hillsides and hilltops. You, you understand what I'm saying? Armies would attack and conquer and enforce their rule over a particular city by rebuilding right on top of the previous city's structures. Over time, you'd have city upon city upon city stacked higher and higher and higher each time to show onlookers who was in charge. There's a spiritual implication for us here. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are to have a visible presence that boldly glorifies God who rules over all. And I remember this line, as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to have a visible presence that boldly glorifies God who rules over all. Had one of the strangest experiences this afternoon on our way here. Ruthie wanted a cup of coffee. So, Ruthie wants a cup of coffee. Guess what pastor's going to do? I'm going to get her a cup of coffee by Jenkins, right? I don't have to think about it. I get in this line. And I go up there, and I order a simple cup of coffee that I know is already brewed. And I said, throw a little sweetener in there and stir it good, and I'm good to go. Ruthie, however, she wants some funky monkey, low fat, no sugar. You know what I'm saying? I mean, and, and it's got to be whipped cream on top, right? So we pull up there, and they hand me my coffee right away. Because why? Mine's already brewed, right? But they're in there getting a construction permit for Ruthie's coffee, and they're taking their sweet time. And there's this young girl working there. And I can hear her. She's wearing a headset. I look like a barista tonight. She looked like me in a way. She had this headset on. And she's taking orders and moving. And she leaned out and put her hand over the microphone. Real concerned look on her face. She works at the coffee shop. She said, do you know what bold coffee is? And now I think this is a joke, right? A girl in there is asking me if I know what bold coffee is. And Ruthie leaned over and she said, well, bold means strong. She said, someone asking you for bold coffee? She said, yes, but I didn't know what it was. Ruthie said, well, it's strong coffee. She went, thank you so much. I couldn't believe it. She didn't know what bold coffee was. We're to stand proudly as a city on a hill. We're to shine brightly as a candle positioned high on a stand. Our lives are to cast a glow to the watching world that confirms we've been in the presence of God. Let's look at how this gets done. You got to be conspicuous. Did you know that? God did not call us to be closet Christians. 
He didn't call us to be closet Christians. Amen? So we're to be conspicuous. Rather than living a covert Christian life, we're to wear our association with Jesus with confidence, remembering that people all around us are wondering in search of something or someone to soothe their souls. We can't help pointing people to faith in Christ unless we're known as Christ followers ourselves. Frequently, I have someone, every now and then they approach me, and they talk about their work or their school environment, regaling me with all the sordid details of their colleagues' wayward lives. Pastor, you don't know how lucky you are to get to be working for the church all day. The language I have to put up with at the place where I work, it's just dark. It's a dark, dark place. What these people fail to recognize is that the place of darkness where they find themselves could be illuminated if we shine our light. Their office or school isn't their punishment. It's their divinely given ministry where they can glorify God. Next, you got to be consistent. Too many churches today are full of inconsistent people. They say they love God and are committed to serving Him alone, but they live in a manner totally indistinguishable from the way people far from God choose to live. Ow. Feel a little chill in the air. <laughs> Number four, listen to this one. Number four, you got to be consumed. And finally, we are to be utterly consumed by the light of Jesus in our lives. John the Baptist said it this way I must decrease, but he must increase. John chapter 3, verse 30. So, I'm a funny thinker. I mean, when I say funny, I think weird sometimes. And I don't, I don't make excuses for it or apologize for it. I read this. I must decrease, but he must increase. Isn't that the same thing as saying we make more room for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives by making less room for ourselves? We make more room for the Holy Spirit's work in our lives by making less room for ourselves. Because when our light shines as Jesus intends, prompting us to love well and do well in our world, people will absolutely be compelled to glorify, not us, but the Father in heaven above. Wherever it is you find yourself, God intends for you to be salt and light right there, right there. I highlighted this, and I'm praying that God will help me. Last, last two lines of this message. Last two lines. There was a man named Oswald Chambers, a writer, right? Oswald Chambers, never allow the thought, I am of no use where I am. He wrote that. Never allow the thought, I am of no use where I am. Well, the response to that is, you are certainly of no use where you are not. If Oswald Chambers could say that, that never allow the thought, I'm of no use where I am, well, you certainly are no use where you're not. May we recommit ourselves to influencing the world around us instead of being wholly influenced by it. We're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. That's the way it's got to be. God help me. God help me. God help you. Amen? You know, look, I, I, I want to be, be positive all the time. I want to be uplifting all the time. I want to be encouraging all the time. But i got to say this. If we were getting it right, there wouldn't be only 25, 26, 27, 30 people in this building. If we were getting it right. Let's be honest with each other. We're getting it right. We wouldn't be looking at just 30 people, all right? Look, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, um, I, I pray about what's said and done in this pulpit. And when I make a mistake like I did a few weeks ago, it cost me some sleep. Why? Because I'm responsible for this ministry of this pulpit as a pastor preaching and teaching the Word. Can you say amen? I am. And I know it, right? And I take it very seriously. Okay, so do you know I love you? 
Well, I love God more than I love you because that's exactly what I'm supposed to do. Do you know I love God more than I love my wife? Do you know I love God more than I love my children? Now, you ain't going to believe this, but I love God more than I love my grandbabies. Do you know why? Because I want God to help me be the grandfather that they 